I want to begin tonight by telling a story, because stories, perhaps more than any element of our faith, are vital to sustaining religious communities. Stories pass on insights. They help give shape to religious tradition. They recall paradigmatic moments and people. They define a community. They are vehicles for revelation. Even though they may be ordinary, stories can tell us a lot about the sacred. This story, I think, does all of those things. And it's a true story, and it happened in a place as ordinary as St. Louis, and as recently as 2008. Now, the year that stretched from the summer of 2008 to the summer of 2009 was particularly bizarre for the Catholic Church in the United States. And I know that's a stiff competition. <laughs> because it was during that time that Father Roy Bourgeois was given his first notification from the Vatican's Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith that he had 30 days in which to recant his position in support of women's ordination or face excommunication. It was during that same time that Sister Louise Akers was banned by the Archbishop of Cincinnati from teaching catechetics on behalf of the Archdiocese because of her public support for women's ordination. And it was also during this time that Sister Louise Lears was forced out of all church ministerial roles by St. Louis Archbishop Raymond Burke of dear and beloved memory. <laughs> The Archbishop also placed Sister Louise Lears under a severe interdict, banishing her from receiving any of the sacraments within the Archdiocese. Her crime, you guessed it, she supported women's ordination. Interestingly, it was also during this one year that Pope Benedict XVI decided to lift the excommunications of four schismatic bishops who rejected the reforms of the Second Vatican Council. So neoconservative Catholics were welcomed back to the table, and those seeking to extend, extend the table's guest list were sent away hungry. It was while I served on the board of the Women's Ordination Conference that I got to hear more about Sister Louise Lear's experience, her story in particular. And every now and then you run into a story that is so powerful, it shakes you up and it helps to reshape your theology. This story ju did just that for me. On the first Sunday, after she was placed under this interdict, Sister Louise Lears decided she was going to attend Mass. The experience with Burke left her wounded and isolated. Naturally, she wanted to be with her beloved parish community. She did not plan to receive communion because she did not want to jeopardize the parish any further. But this was her community and she wanted at least to be physically present with them who were the body of Christ for her. Her 85-year-old mother was at her side at Mass. When her mother went forward for communion, she said to Louise, follow me. <laughs> Louise did not ask to receive communion, but she did walk by her mother's side. Louise's mother took communion, she broke it, turned around and gave it to her daughter. After witnessing this, Sister Louise's sister went and did the same thing. And then seeing what was going on, many other parishioners, one by one, also broke their bread and gave it to Sister Louise Lears. By the end of communion, Louise's hands were filled, they were overflowing with fragments of the Eucharist. After Mass, as the family was standing in the back, Louise's mother turned to her daughter and said, I was the first person to feed you, and I will feed you now. Our stories define us as a community. They recall paradigmatic people. They are vehicles for the sacred. In that moment, Louise Lear's 85-year-old mother revealed more about the love of God, more about living the gospel of love, more about what makes a true church than our hierarchy seems to have been able to do in quite some time. And she figured out that secret that the hierarchy doesn't want any of us to know. 
lay people have extraordinary sacramental <laughs> power.